Welcome everyone to Friday Coffee Meetup. I'm Christy Connor, your host. Friday Coffee Meetup is the largest active innovation, entrepreneurial, and tech meetup in Los Angeles, California. We have gone virtual for COVID. We are focused on bringing innovation um, to the community uh, at large. And we are grateful for all of our members who join us. We have over 7,000 members. I'm also very grateful for all of the Friday Coffee Meetup volunteers that help us each week. I'd love to show you their faces. They do everything from helping us organize the meetup and the logistics to organizing speakers and maintaining our YouTube channel and podcast channel. So if you've ever missed any of our speakers, you can check them out there as well. We are running this meetup via Zoom. We are also broadcasting to LinkedIn Live, so you can feel free to join us there as well. However, we will only be taking questions via the Zoom meeting itself. In a moment, I'm gonna be putting that information on how to join us there into the LinkedIn Live as well. This morning's presentation, we will go through a presentation. We will also have Q&A. The Q&A will be handled from Zoom via the Q&A panel in the center. As you will see if you're in Zoom, our panel chat is open. You can feel free and say hi to one another. If you have jobs that you're hiring for, please place them there. We are all about creating livelihood. So please place those there. You can also find information about our speaker today. So that channel is unmoderated, so use your best behavior, but feel free to say hello to everyone. We are going to be doing some after meeting networking today. So if you are interested in on the Zoom meeting, you can stay on the line at the end and we will move you over into the panelist pool so that you can say hi to our speaker, maybe ask some more questions and get to know other people in the network. We are so pleased to be hearing from David Hang this morning from Skylar Consulting. He's going to be talking to us this morning about back office wonders, those functions like IT, HR, finance. And he's gonna talk us through some of the do's and don'ts of those departments and how to keep things running smoothly. We are looking forward to hearing from him about that. He also brings a very extensive background in executive leadership at companies from Earthling to Zappos, as well as being a retired police sergeant and the national director of the United States Coast Guard's Auxiliary International Affairs Directorate. Amazing. I'm so looking forward to hearing from him. He has such an extensive list of accomplishments. David, welcome. We are looking forward to hearing from you today and asking more questions. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Christy. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, today, um, we're going to be talking about back office. We're not going to talk about defense core operation throughout the, throughout the world with our allies. So we're going to focus on that today. Okay, let me just share my screen here. Can everybody see this? Okay, my name is yep, David. It looks good. Uh, my name is David Huang. I am the principal at Skyler Consulting. We are a um, back office consulting firm. We handle IT, HR finance, as well as some engineering and regulatory for our partner companies. Um, I also have a role in the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary as the Director of International Affairs, where we, um, where we handle uh, defense cooperation issues with countries throughout, our, throughout the world um, in our partnerships. Um, previously, I was the Executive Director of Vegas.com, um, and prior to that, I was the Director of HR over at IDX Global. Um, the list goes on. Most of my experience is in back office. So um, rest assured, I'm going to be sharing some interesting stories with you. Um, when, when Evan asked me to do this talk, and I, I thought to myself, you know what? Who wants to hear about back office? It's the most uninteresting part of a business. Most, mostly people want to focus on product development, marketing. Those are the exciting parts of an office. But at the end of the day, 
back office is what drives the company. And a, a well-functioning back office is the, is the lifeblood of a healthy company. And when you're running it efficiently and reliably, back office allows you to do what you do best, which is focus on what you went into business doing. Um, nobody went into business saying, I want to do HR. People went into business saying, I want to fix something. I want to make something. Nobody went into business saying, I want to do IT. I want to do HR. I want to do accounting. But these are all necessary components of a company. So um, Scholar Consulting focuses on taking that away from the business owner so they can focus on their passion. And I like it because when people hire us, we, we go into a company and tell them, okay, this is what you're doing wrong, and they pay us for it. And we provide solution, and they pay us again. And then they pay us again when we implement the solution. So that's what we get paid three times when we go into engagement which is great because at the end of the day, the business owner is happy because all of these ancillary um, departments are being handled, all of these ancillary functions are being handled. Let's talk about focusing on your passion. A business owner shouldn't be spending a lot of time on back office. Is it necessary? Absolutely but most of the time should be spent on what's driving your business. You should be spending your time on setting aside time for building your infrastructure and growth. And I'll give you an example of that because um, when Earthling first started, I was employee number 89. And by the time we ended the first year, we were at about three to 4,000. And, and we were just up the street in Pasadena um, off of Eden Canyon. And during this growth period, we were bringing, we were hiring roughly about 10 to 15 people a day. And we were hiring about maybe 33, 25 to 33% of applicants. And when you, when you get to the hiring part, you, for every person that you hired, you're, you saw about maybe anywhere between five to 10 people. So you, if you add that up, that's a lot of interviews. And during this explosive growth period, what's really interesting is what happens to a company when you're facing that type of growth? Well, it's hemorrhaging, basically is what, it, what it's doing. When you're faced with explosive growth, one of the things that happens is your infrastructure is tested because your infrastructure wasn't designed to handle this type of influx of people. So what we did was we stopped all hiring for an entire week and a half and figured out how do we get this back on track? Because people coming in didn't have chairs to sit in, didn't have desks to sit at, didn't have telephones to, to use, didn't have computers because all of these things were back ordered. So we stopped all of our functions and started saying, okay, what do we need? How do we pace ourselves so that we don't have 20 or 30 employees sitting around? Well, actually not sitting around because they didn't have chairs. They're just standing around and, and doing nothing. So what we did was we stopped, evaluated, and re reacted to what we were doing. So how do you do that? You get all your department heads together and say, all right, purchasing, instead of buying 20 new computers, let's buy enough computers for the next month, two months out. Let's work with our partners on the supply side to make that happen. Same with any type of logistics, chairs, desks, facilities, make sure that's taken care of. On the accounting side, making sure that our payroll system. So at that time, I remember we, we had a payroll system that can only handle about a thousand employees. And unfortunately, it was buckling under the, pay, un, under the, the hiring we were doing. So we didn't understand at that time that you know what, it's probably best to outsource it because the person that was in charge of it has worked with this piece of software for the last 20 years. So we made sure that we streamlined that process. Getting everything up and running is a task where you have to manage the own and own it. You have to bring in all of your key players and make sure everybody understands there's a common goal. And that common goal is to get people on board, making sure that they are they are, they, they are um, 
well equipped to handle their job. They are well trained. So being in an environment where you spend your time and what is the best use of your time is a key function. Because as a business owner, you got to be prepared for growth. You got to be prepared for a down market. And a lot of times when a small business owner, what they do is they have a lot of skill sets. You got to ask yourself when you can do something, should you be doing something? So <clears throat> let me get to the right. So one of the things that um, happened in, in, um, in my experience is when you can, should you? We had an, I was working with a CEO. He was a very talented doctor and he was um, running a medical device company. And every, every now and then I see him down in, down in um, our art department and just working with our designers. And unfortunately, I, I never understood that. So I stopped him and I said, what are you doing talking to, talking to the, um, the advertising marketing people and helping them with the website? He says, oh, I really enjoy that. And I said, look, we're, we're facing growth right now. You got 10,000 things going on. Should, I know you can do this, but should you be spending your time? So one of the things that as a small business owner or an entrepreneur, you should focus on what you should be spending your time on. How, always, that, always be asking yourself, how will you spend your time? Is this the best use of my time at this given moment? And I'm constantly asking myself that because I'm constantly distracted. So um, back office, hire the nerds, all right? Hire a good, good accountant hire a good HR person, hire a good IT person. Because if they're competent, you should, be, you should be focusing on your core business and core competencies. It doesn't mean you have to hire them as a full FTE. You can hire them as a consultant. You can hire an outsourcing company like mine to, to handle all that for you. But once you hire them, trust them. Leave them to do what they're, they're best to do. They do this stuff every day, you don't. You may be able to do it, you may, everybody has access to Google. Everybody has access to YouTube. And I'm sure you can Google anything you can, um, you can um, um, want in, in terms of all these back offices. But that goes back to the question, should you be doing it? And is that the best use of your time? So one of the things I tell my CEOs that I work with, <laughs> I said, you know what? Do the Ronco rotisserie model. Set it, set it up good and forget it, set it and forget it. I'm sure you've, you've heard that from an infomercial, but it's, it's actually a good analogy what, what that good back off should be. You set it up and forget about it because your professionals that you've hired will let you know when you, you need to pay attention to a certain area. Let's talk about proactive and reactive. So um, one of my backgrounds, I've, I have a very interesting background. I'm, I'm a police sergeant with the city of San Fernando and I'm retired from. In police work, there is proactive and reactive time, okay? Proactive is when I'm driving around looking for crimes to happen, looking for, for traffic violations or somebody climbing through a window, that's proactive work. Reactive work is when somebody's calling 911 saying, I have a burglar in my house. I have, a, I have a need for service right now. Then we're going to it and reacting to that situation. Whereas proactive, I'm out looking for things to happen and preventing things from happening. So how does that translate into business? Well, first of all, we have, we have a saying in police work, it's better to have it and not need it and need it and not have it. So you want to put yourself in the position of being proactive and less reactive. And that's, that's done by being able to anticipate what is coming down the pipe for your company. And a good proactive measure is having the scaffold. A good scaffold is your back office. That is your HR, your IT, and, and, your, and your accounting. Those functions will give you the scaffold that you need for growing your company. If you have those things in place, 
your growth is going to be that much easier. You're not reacting to situations. You're proactively putting measures in place to give you the tools that you need to bring your business to the next level, such as if in accounting, you have all the tools that you need to make an informed decision about your cash flow. You know what's coming down. You know, you know what's coming down in terms of hiring. You know what, you know what's, you know what's coming down in terms of your IT needs. In if you're selling something, you know you need to get PCI compliance. So those are the type of things that you need in place for 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 growth. And once you have the scaffold in place, what you can do is grow. The growth is easier when your scaffolding is in place. Otherwise, you become reactive to these situations that's out of your control. You're reacting to something, which means that your the situation you're facing is out of your control, and you're reacting to mitigate the issue, the, con the constant um, attention it requires. And that's how you succeed: is being proactive. You always want to stay proactive, stay ahead of the game, have a good growth plan, growth plan. And have a have the scaffolding or the infrastructure to build your business. Last thing we're going to talk about is culture, and and I talked to John uh, a little bit about culture. Culture is a catch-all. Um, it could be um, merging of two companies um, with two diverging cultures um, to how you're. Uh, how to build culture around your company so that your employees are more engaged. And HR is your key partner in establishing a company culture. A lot of times people want to, people see good culture and they want to copy it. And, and I was brought into a company and, and they asked me, look, um, and we had a very long conversation about culture. At the end of the meeting, um, the CEO said, drop the book on my, in front of me and says, this is the culture I want. And it was the, it was the um, building happiness, um, delivering happiness um, by Tony Shea at, at Zappos. He says, I want this culture in my company. And he says, can you deliver it? And I said, you know, I don't think I can um, because number one, um, it, it, you're two different companies. He says, well, this is the cu cu culture I want. Can you deliver it? And do you know about this? And I said, well, I do know about it because the Zappos VP of HR used to report to me and, and prior to her engagement at, um, at Zappos. So I, I'm very familiar with it. And, and, and we did some work with Zappos on, on that front. Um, but what we can't do is bring this culture to you because culture is unique. Culture is unique to each individual company. Culture is organic. And when you, when you talk about culture, you have to look at your employee base. For that company that we were consulting with, they had a bunch of scientists looking at microscopes in the clean room all day long. Whereas the culture at Zappos was more of a customer service centric and sales centric culture. Those are two very different populations. When you, when you wanna bring culture into your company, one of the first thing you need to do is understand your employee population. And how do you do that? Well, the, the key things that I hear when I'm out talking to, to employers is employees want competitive salaries. Now, who doesn't, okay? Everybody wants competitive salary. But as an employer, who, what you wanna do is you wanna pay your employees enough where pay is no longer an issue for them in their employment. So they can focus on their work. They're not worrying about, oh, I'm not making enough. Make it, I'm not saying pay everybody 20% above market, but pay, pay them enough so where pay is no longer an issue in their employment. Employee development. Um, in my 25 years, other than pay, employee development is important. People want to learn something new. It doesn't have to be job related. I mean, many different companies have in um, tuition reimbursement programs, great. However, if you're, if you're listening to your employees, um, provide those programs where they have an interest and what they hold value in. Take for instance, when I was working with Vegas.com, 
one of the one of the things that we put in place in, in the very get go was a tuition reimbursement program because we had a high um, hourly employee base um, who are who haven't finished their school yet. So we put in a tuition reimbursement program. On top of that, we wanted to bring in classes and speakers and programs where they can enrich themselves in their life and hopefully through that process help us in in delivering a better product to our customers so what do we do we worked with our casino partners and also our show partners to put all their their shows and their and their trainings available to our employees so if, if a group of employees are interested in hotel operations they can actually go to the mgm or caesars and and participate in their classes also we had a group of employees who were interested in table game operations. So we took that group of people and we trained them to be casino dealers. Now, it didn't really benefit us as an organization to do that, but it reaped us a whole lot of benefit in terms of employee loyalty, in terms of employee happiness, employee morale. Um, we have one, one group of people who were interested in our tour operations. So our tour operations, we put them on a helicopter or an airplane where they where they're flying flying to all these tour tour different um, destinations and learn about the operations and at, at these different companies tour companies. So giving your employees um, what they would normally be interested in um, and, and giving them an avenue to get these experiences is immeasurable in terms of employee morale. What so one of the things um, that you want to do in, in um, once you get to a certain size is looking at your employees' time and how they're spending it and what they're spending it on. Um, back when I was working with e-companies, which is an incubator out of Santa Monica, an internet incubator out of Santa Monica, um, we put in a concierge at work. Now, it seems a little bougie, but at the end of the day, it helped us immensely. Why? Because we discovered our employees were leaving work to go pick up their laundry, leaving work to go pay a bill, leaving work to um, do a number of things. And when you're having a workforce that's paid well in excess of six figures doing mundane things, it doesn't bode well for, for your time efficiency. So what we did was we brought in concierge. We paid that person at that time $50,000 a year. And they handle all the menial tasks that employees go out during the day for. For instance, we had her order lunch for people. We had her pick up laundry. We had her book hotel reservations, travel reservations. So at the end of the day, it seemed like an ex uh, exorbitant expense for a company. That what we did was we did a cost analysis. We were saving the company quite a bit of money because our highly paid individuals were staying at, rather than going to pick up their laundry, they were staying at work, working during that time. So in the last, <clears throat> in the last um, five or six years, employees, what employees has found that company social responsibility was important to them. So I wanna give you a uh, story about what that means. Employees want to know their company is doing good for the world. So back at Earthlink, back in 95, 96, we were faced with um, an issue. We had 300 parking spaces and we had about 1500 employees at that time. We also had the California, Southern California AQMD, Air Quality Management District, um, um, coming down and saying, okay, you need to reduce your um, emissions that your employees are, are um, producing into the LA basin. And if you don't do something, we're going to fine you. And I asked them, I said, well, how much is the fine? And it was well in excess of um, six figures, high six figures. So we thought, all right, we have a parking problem. We have employees who can't, who's getting to work late because they can't find parking. We have a government breathing down our neck. How do we do this? Well, we started a van pool program. Now, that's not very exciting, just like any, part, any other part of back office. 
a van pool is not exciting. It's, it's a distraction to many parts of the company. But we turned what was distracting and a compliance issue and a facilities issue into a win. What we did was we started a, almost a mini bus service, picking up all over the LA basin of, of 100 vans, picking up employees, dropping them off, and delivering back home. Employees were happy because they were being picked up from home by, by basically a private transportation service and dropped off at work. Um, they're being socially responsible because they're um, because the AQMD were, were contributing to the clean air of, of California. And also we solved their parking problem. So those are the type of things. You can take a compliance issue where the government's coming down and threatening to fine you, and you can take a logistics issue which is a facilities issue where we can't find parking and, and turn that into, into another win. Now, ultimately, what we have, what we have paid in fines, we, in, rather than paying in fines, we turned it into an employee benefit. So those are some of the things that we can, um, you can do at your company is turn compliance issues into a win, turn, turning, turning adversity into an opportunity. Um, back office isn't the most interesting thing in the world to do work on, but certainly you need to have your eye on it. And as an entrepreneur, you should have a, a understanding of it and so, you can, so you can talk to your professionals about it. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions because um, I, I find question and answers um, is a very good opportunity for you to, to um, dig into my experience a little bit and, and for me to share. Wonderful, David. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. What an extensive experience that you have. What do you see um, for workplace culture with the current work from home? How do you see it adapting to remote work or hybrid remote slash on-site work? Well, um, we we have a lot of clients that, that, well, actually all of our clients are currently working from home with, a, with the exception of a small segment of their of their workforce, which works in labs and and um, needs to be in, in the office, and with the with COVID, um, it's going to change the dynamics of work, office work, um, rather drastically in the next year. You're gonna people are real companies and people and employees are realizing that they don't need to be at work to work. Um, what we call what we call button seat. Your butt doesn't need to be in a, a seat in the office to be effective. Okay, you can be just as effective sitting at home, working at your own pace. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about the work product that you're that you're um, as bosses. What we want to see. I, I find a lot of I find there's a lot of um, employers that have a correlation between time in an office and, and work product. And I often have this conversation. I said, look, you hire these professionals to be professionals. They have a project they are working on. If they're not performing, they're not going to perform whether they're sitting in your office or sitting at home. You measure them by what they have produced. You don't measure them by how many hours they're sitting in the seat. Now that's that's professional level um, work. However, there are certain certain type of work that needs to be in the office, um, shift work, for instance. So yes, with um, culturally, it's going to change dramatically over the next couple of years when when offices when when employers find out they don't need to have a big office presence, um, and people are able to work from home, and you're going to see a lot more flexibility in in terms of employee. Um, work environments. However, with that said, your risk management departments are going to have an interesting time because now with an extension of your home as a workplace, um, people are discovering that if you get hurt, hurt from home, if you fall and trip over your kid's toy, it is a workplace injury now. So um, make sure you coordinate that with your uh, workers comp people because at the end of the day, every, every Every off home office is now a workplace, and therefore subject to workers' comp. That's a great pointer. You know, you have a really interesting background in that you've been 
working with, in corporate with, you know, innovative environments that are probably more matrix, and then you have the, you know, uh, police, uh, military angle as well that might be more hierarchical or more structured. Mm -hmm. How have you taken practices from both and applied them to the other organizations or, or practices that you found from one and, and put it in the other organizations, especially around culture? You know, I don't take too many of the military um, hierarchy and business practices on the professional side because of this. The federal government is a is an environment where it is not conducive to fast moving companies. Federal government takes a long time just to make one decision. I want to give you an example. Um, one of the things I'm currently working on is um, I was on the phone two weeks ago with the embassy, the U.S. embassy in Hanoi, and the Viet Vietnamese government wanted to um, get some training from the U.S. government on ICS, Incident Command System, which is the which is the system that coordinates multiple agencies during a natural disaster. How do we provide this training? Well, we figured to get the just the answer from the US government, from the Department of State, to whether or not we can provide this training will require a six month process just to get it. Yes, we can or cannot do it. I don't bring anything like that, those practices to the private sector. The private sector has much more flexibility in terms of decision making, where we have a problem, identify the problem, what are, what are our options to solutions, implement the solutions. And that can be done in less than a day. Whereas that same problem can take months, even years with the federal government. Very different. Um, you know, it's been a challenging year for everyone the last year. What are you personally feeling inspired by as we kind of look to the year ahead? Well, looking at the year ahead, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, the vaccine will make a difference in how the workplace is going to return to normal. And what is the new normal is the question. Um, I think most employers are going to look at a hybrid model of being in office um, and, and, and have a flexible work schedule from home. Um, I'm hopeful that business is going to come back, especially on, on the um, service side. I know the professional side wasn't um, wasn't hit as hard and, and uh, as the as the service service um, sector. I'm hoping, um, especially me being based out of Vegas. I mean, we were decimated. Um, we have roughly a 25% unemployment rate because um, we have we have a we have a um, hospitality centric um, economy, and and a lot of the a lot of the ancillary services that support that were very much hurt by it. So hopefully, at least at least in the near term, I think with the vaccines coming out, with confidence coming back a little bit in terms of people um, being being outside, um, I think the Q2 Q2 will roughly be the same. Q3 Q4 will we'll, we'll, we're going to see some see some recovery. I agree. I'm hopeful hey, Christy, for the future, is, the year ahead. Please go ahead, John. Yeah, if I could jump in and ask David a real quick question, because it's been a uh, very interesting topic. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Skylar's uh, business model? In other words, what percentage of your clients are mature companies that are looking to reduce their fixed overhead by outsourcing some of their back office versus startups and, and emerging companies that are growing but don't want to build a, a back office and maybe turn to a um, third party uh, company and have a basically a, a turnkey solution. And, and obviously they now they can move a little bit faster and, and focus on what you said earlier about uh, focusing on their core competency and what they're good at or what their str strengths are rather than what their weaknesses are. Great, uh, that's, that's an excellent question, John. Um, First, I want to talk about my clients. Um, we have clients, we have Fortune, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 clients that we do work for. 
um, very specific focused projects. But the majority of our clients um, are, are emerging companies, startups to, to mid-sized companies. A lot of these companies are either virtual or have very limited um, pres uh, footprint in terms of real estate. They're mostly medical startups, medical device companies, or, or emerging pharmaceutical companies. Our business model is, uh, is kind of funny because we work with a lot with the universities, University of Southern California, um, Stanford University, UC Santa Barbara, UCSD, a lot of, a lot of the universities. When, when university professors come out with um, an invention, um, oftentimes the, the school will ask them to commercialize it and the school will take a portion of that company. It is up to the professor that's coming out with this technology to find funding for it, whether it's VC money, whether it's friends and family or um, backed by a major pharmaceutical company. But it's interesting. Not one professor I've ever met has said, you know what, I'm so excited about doing HR, IT and finance. They do not want to do that. They want to focus on their research and that's all they want to do. So what we offer is a turnkey product where it's what we call a startup in a box. We go in and we take care of every back office function from um, incorporating your, your company either in California or Delaware or both um, all the way to making sure that your, your um, accounting is up and running, your IT is up and running, you're meeting the requirements of the NIH or DLD or whatever government sponsored program you're in, and you're passing your due diligence with the pharmaceutical company. So all back office functions come to me. So they're free to focus on their, on their, um, on their research. Now, basically it's, it's a one-stop shop turnkey option um, function. Um, the, the thing we discovered they like the most is that while the, HR is offered by the major payroll services, such as ADP or paychecks, or even as a side product for um, your insurance carrier. What it's lacking is the um, responsiveness of these services into to the individual business owner. So whereas the individual going through Skylar, we are a extension of the company rather than a rather than a phone call um, into a call center, um, per se. <clears throat> they know who they're talking to. They have an assigned uh, account manager. They have an assigned HR person. They have an assigned accountant. So, and the depth of expertise is also there. Whereas if you hire a HR person or accounting person directly, you're limited to that person's knowledge, whether, whether they're a director level or a generalist level or an entry level, you're limited to those stratas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas if you go with an outsource model, not only do you have the transactional taken care of on the, let's say HR transactional piece or the, or the bookkeeping piece in, uh, in accounting, you also have access to HR directors with vast amounts of experience. Uh, and on the, <clears throat> on the finance side, you also have, you also have people who are CFOs or controllers. So your, your range of knowledge is, is very deep. Uh, I, I see that there is a, a question in the Q&A, but I, if I could just add one or ask one more question, and that is corporate secrets. You know, one of the concerns about a lot of entrepreneurs is outsourcing. Of course, you're going to have NDAs and things like that in place, but you're also going to have a so-called workforce that are not your employees. And so how do you control uh, corporate secrets, you know, patents or even the, uh, the scientific research? Well, first of all, I mean, when you're engaging in an outsource, outsource firm um, and, and working on, on, on confidential material, obviously you're signing confidentiality agreements. And, and, and if, you, if you violate that, you can put your firm in, in, in jeopardy. Um, all of our consultants sign, sign confidentiality agreements with, with our firm, um, as well as the firm that they are currently working on. Great, our next question. In your back office work, do you focus on optimization as well? You know, reducing process errors, payment efforts, operational mistakes? 
especially Absolutely. for companies with lots of scale? Yes, um, be, what we do with companies is, established companies is, we go in, we, we look at all of their business processes and we look at all the decision points and we look at all the, all the processes that's involved in a certain process and we try to streamline it. And we bring, and we bring best practices to that company. We know what, what is done in the industry. We know what is, what is common in terms of um, practices. So we, if, we see a, if we see something that's inefficient, we will make that recommendation. We, we recommend you do it X, Y, Z, um, rather than um, what you're, how you're handling it currently. And in my experience, most CEOs and most CFOs and COOs are very receptive to that because not only are we reducing the time and, and decision process, um, we're really, we're really you know, moving the company along on a, on a much faster pace. Does that well, question? Yes. Um, has this, I have the questions. I know you, you walked through your presentation. Did this bring up anything else for you that you would want to share with us today? Now, one of the key things that I hear mostly with you know, I, I've been in HR and back office for about 30 years. Um, and it, it's, it's really surprising to me that it's the same thing that keeps on happening. One of the things that, one of the things that keeps on happening and, and the question that keeps on um, popping up is performance management employees. Everybody is afraid to tell their employee and give honest, and relevant feedback to their employees. And one of the takeaways that you should, you should take away from this, this talk is be transparent with your employees. But if you're coming to me saying, I want to fire X, um, so-and-so, but you haven't done anything about it in the last year and a half, it's not that employee's fault, it's your fault, okay? It's address, be, be candid with your employees. If they're not doing something that you, they're not meeting your expectations, let them know because they may not know what your expectations are. Um, be communicative with your employees, set your expectations. And if they're not meeting them, call them out on it as soon as you see a deficiency because you're not doing anybody any favors if you just hold it within yourself. It's like a relationship in a marriage. It's brilliant advice and so difficult to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it's communication, right? Always working on those skills. I agree. That is one of the keys to being effective in relationships and managing an organization. So thank you for that, David. Thank you for being here with us this morning. We're excited to have the team answer some more questions for you from you um, or ask you some more questions this morning. What I'm going to do now for those folks who are on the line, please stay on the line. I'm going to turn off the Zoom and hit the recording, get that turned off. And then we will go ahead and move whoever wants to remain and come over and say hi to David and network with some of the other attendees. So just hang on the line if you want to stay there. Thank you to everybody who's been on Zoom as well as on LinkedIn Live. We are grateful to have you view us this morning. Our next meetup will be in a few weeks. Keep an eye on our meetup page. We are still organizing some speakers. So we will look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. And until then, stay safe and well. Take care, everyone.